Rights Groups as a contractor to the U.S. Air Force Space and Missile Systems Organization, as a reviewer of proposals to the National Science Foundation, written 60 journal publications in national and international journals, and has served as a lecturer on STEM topics, much like the one he will do be doing for us today. Please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> and with that, we can see your presentation and you are all good to go whenever you are ready, Tony. Uh, thank you, Cade, and thank you, Ray. Uh, <clears throat> I appreciate uh, returning to MSU uh, where I taught for 16 years. And today's lecture has to do with uh, strange case of the missing missile, which uh, I have advertised as uh, arising from a cooperation between uh, MSU and long gone World War II German rocket scientists. And uh, I know this is probably <clears throat> But somewhere in the history of the world, the last uh, 60, 70 years, uh, America, as you probably remember, uh, played a key role in uh, defending the free world and uh, developing missiles that can be used to defend that world was one of the things we did very well in this country. Now, <clears throat> These missiles were being tested usually by launching from uh, a, a, a spot in our California coast over the Pacific Ocean. And uh, this talk concerns one of those missiles that uh, vanished and were never found. And we, uh, we are trying to uh, understand how that happened. And uh, I played some role in that, and I'd like to explain the role. But look at the last line of this slide. <laughs> I want to make sure that when we talk about these things, we always consider the possibility that the story you're going to hear is not really true. Uh, I don't know whether this makes for a better atmosphere or mystery or not, but uh, I hope that uh, you will understand in a minute why I'm making this qualification. Uh, I'd like to next show you what uh, the conditions under which those missiles were being tested. And to some extent, they're still being tested today. This line you see on this graph represents the trajectory, one of those, what was known as the intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, the word intercontinental derived from the fact that these guys can go a long way. We're talking about thousands of miles. And the word ballistic has to do with the fact that, as you'll see in a minute, uh, a lot of the travel between the launching point and the target occurs under ballistic conditions. In other words, the darn thing is not flying. It is just moving because somebody threw it like you throw a rock. In the beginning of the trajectory here, what I called launch phase, you can see it on the left of the screen, uh, the missile is simply accelerating from the launching point going up. And I indicate that in this region, the calculations engineers make to see if it's doing well, are all, ha all have to do with straightforward aerodynamics. Uh, a, a rocket engine is burning. Uh, uh, the, the flow is still uh, mildly supersonic. There's no, uh, in other words, a textbook type operation at this point. Uh, in the middle of the trajectory, the missile has gotten out of the atmosphere. You notice I have here an indication that's getting out at about 16, uh, 160,000 feet from the ground. So from this point on, the trajectory is really uh, exoatmospheric, we call it, indicating that the thing is moving out of the atmosphere. It's being thrown like you throw a rock. Nothing has happened. There's no interaction between, the thing is in a vacuum. 
then finally, as you near the target, the thing has to come back into the atmosphere. And here is where all, all hell breaks loose because this thing is now going at a speed of about, say, 15,000 feet per second. We're talking about a Mach number of about 15. And uh, it's entering the atmosphere and the, the, the entry phase, as I call it, can be divided into uh, the early and the late phase. In the, in the uh, early phase, uh, the missile is encountering air molecules. So the, the stuff you learned how to handle this is not really fluid mechanics. It's a very, very difficult discipline. And then afterwards, you come into the late entry phase, which is the one where things really get very dicey because the thing is going very fast and it's heating up. Uh, it's essentially on fire. Uh, the materials of the, uh, of the missile are very important at this point because obviously you want to make it survive and there is chemistry involved. It's, it's a mess. Uh, I remember as a student, the last thing I ever wanted to do is think about this late entry phase. It's really very, very difficult to analyze. Uh, usually the missiles we're talking about are cylindrical with a uh, cone nose tip and the very tip of that cone is a uh, hemisphere. Um, and uh, if you look at this hemisphere as it is being uh, subjected to the reentry conditions. Uh, here I have a little cartoon showing what you would expect. The, the flow outside, the airflow outside this thing is going at Mach number between 15 and 20. Uh, there is a bow shock wave standing in front of the nose tip. And on the surface of the nose tip, there is a viscous airflow, which is called the bonder layer. And that's the one that's going to occupy us now for the next several minutes. Um, the uh, temperatures we're talking about is are caused because this uh, missile is, is slamming into the air and consequently it is heating it. The energy that is consumed by slowing down of the vehicle is going into the heating of the air around it and therefore also heating of the missile itself. And here is kind of like a, the kind of a formula we engineers use to estimate the temperatures that the nose tip can, uh, can attain. And this simple formula here is something to remember. If Mach number is like 20, you see what can happen here. And uh, one reasonable estimate is that the temperature uh, of the air on, around the missile and of the missile itself uh, is going into thousands and thousands of degrees. I have here 22,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it, it so happens that this number is exaggerated. The energy goes into splitting the, the molecules into atoms and the atoms into electrons and nuclei. So, there is, a, there is an expense that has to be paid there. So the temperature is not very high. It can be say 10,000 10, degrees, but 10,000 degrees is not exactly what you'd like to have in your fireplace in the winter. So uh, it's already pretty bad. Uh, now, now comes a kind of an interesting situation because uh, I have redrawn the, the, the picture I drew a minute ago of the missile nose tip except I've added a, uh, I've added a uh, qualification here. This viscous bonder layer flowing over the hemisphere, you can follow my cursor here, uh, is originally laminar. In other words, the fluid is quiet, flowing in a nice laminar viscous way, but somewhere along the line, the bonder layer becomes turbulent. And uh, the point of transition between the laminar and the turbulent state, is really a key point in this entire presentation because it gives the first hint about what happens to the missing missile. Down below here, I have a graph, which is a little, I will not spend very much time on it, except to indicate that this lower curve is the heat transfer and friction that occurs on the surface of the vehicle if the bundle layer is laminar. And the upper curve uh, shows you what happens when 
the boundary becomes turbulent. And it shows you that it, as soon as the boundary becomes turbulent, the friction and heat transfer from the fluid to the nose tip increases by a tremendous amount. You'll notice there's factors of almost 10 in jumping from this curve to this curve. This is a logarithmic plot, okay? Um, and therefore, if this guy starts heating the vehicle, uh, a lot of interesting things will happen to the surface. And what happens as the vehicle descends closer and closer to the earth, this transition point, we call it, moves closer to the apex of the vehicle. So that is a key point to remember because in a minute, you will see how this can create some conditions on the vehicle tip that will provide the beginning of the explanation of the missing missiles. I have here in, 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 in words what I just finished saying, uh, that, that uh, if, if you really start now whittling, if you start heating the missile surface, you begin melting it. You begin removing, removing material. And the next fact is that the nose tip now be, is being whittled almost literally when you whittle a stick of wood you will begin removing removing material from the surface and you change the shape of this thing. It is not a, a, a hemisphere any longer, but it's something that the next slide will indicate. Okay, so I have here a picture of what reasonably you would expect to happen. The original, this is the original surface of the missile, okay? It's a, a hemisphere followed by cone. And the big arrows here show where what happens as the altitude of the missile decreases and the missile is approaching the ground. You start digging and whittling away at the surface. You see that? In this cartoon, I tried to show exactly what happens to the, to the shape, the shape. That's a key word, the shape of the nose tip. And you end up, as you can see here, you end up with something that looks kind of funny. It looks like a cylinder with a peg sticking out, a sticking out the front. And this is a key point. Uh, actually, on my, in my desk drawer, when I was still teaching at MSU years ago, somebody in the military had given me a sample nose step from a missile that had undergone these conditions. And you could very easily see it was a spike. Unfortunately, when I retired, somebody filched that thing from my desk and I haven't seen it in years. But anyway, the bottom line is suddenly this nice hemisphere cone becomes, as I said, something that looks like a cylinder with a, a little spike sticking out. Now, some of you are impatient at this point. It's, okay, what does it have to do with the lecture, you know? Okay, hold on a minute. Because we're gonna, we're gonna take a, a little break from this story. And I want to go back to World War II um, and uh, remind us that uh, the German scientists who were fighting on the other side during the war uh, were really uh, expert, really doing a fantastic work with things like aviation and rockets and all that stuff. And uh, the guy who was in charge of those German scientists, his name was Werner von Braun. I have his name spelled here wrong. It should be one N, not two Ns at the end of his name. And uh, von Braun, uh, uh, after the war, uh, came to the U.S., he became a citizen. And not only that, but he was for years the pioneer in our efforts to uh, go out into space. And he was a so-called rocket expert and space expert. And, uh, and uh, one of his, one of his uh, associates was, his name was Rudolf Herman, he was an engineer who designed the uh, testing facilities for the rockets which uh, von Braun 
uh, developed for the German military. I went to the Bosman Public Library some years back because I was interested in the so-called secret weapons, the rocket weapons which the Germans had developed during the war. And uh, lo and behold, on page such and such, there is a photograph of Werner von Braun. This is the guy with a dark suit here. Uh, and uh, he's surrounded by high ranking German officers. This photograph was taken around 1942. That was a little more than 70 years ago. And obviously, the, the, the people you see on the screen are German officers listening to what Von Braun is telling them about the research he's doing to produce the weapons which they, the German military, will use to win the war. Anyway, and as I was looking at this photograph, I, I discovered there's another guy here. You see this guy in the light jacket? Um, and if my first thought was, well, if he's another civilian, what the heck is he doing in this group? Well, obviously, the, the deduction you, do, you, you, you have here is that this guy is very important. So Von Braun and he are the ones that are really leading this effort for which the German military is so interested in. And as I looked at this photograph, I looked at this guy's face and I said, I know this guy, I know this guy. And sure enough, there's a photograph, no, excuse me, uh, 10 years after that first photograph I showed you, here's this guy and I at the University of Minnesota because Rudolf Herman, that was his name, uh, became a professor of, of aeronautical engineering after he came to this country. And that was the year I was uh, being a graduate student in aeronautical engineering in Minnesota. So Herman became my professor. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, I, I got to get to know this guy pretty well. He, by the way, Herman was a great guy. I mean, he was a very compassionate, very polite, very, very interesting person, an outstanding teacher. Uh, and uh, he came to this country to work for the U.S. Air Force, would you believe? The project he was working on was uh, called Developments of Ramjet Engines. Uh, the Ramjet is a pipe, a straight pipe that uh, is hit by the airflow as it flies through the air and uh, it, it, it sucks in air, mixes it with the fuel in the combustion chamber, ignites that mixture and expels it at the back and becomes a propulsion device. That was known as the ramjet and it was for many years in the 1940s and 1950s, something which we in this country developed into advanced uh, engines for uh, supersonic aircraft. And indeed, supersonic flight was what these things were best designed for. And Herman had a, a, a project funded by the US Air Force to develop these things. One of the things that Herman discovered was that if you fly this thing at supersonic speeds, what you get in front of it is a normal shock wave. Uh, the normal shock wave is a strange beast it uh, what it does it slows down the flow across it, but also robs the flow of the pressure it had. And the combustion people didn't like that because combustion engineers like to have the fuel burn at the highest possible pressure inside the engine. That's how you get the thrust. Okay, when you want to blow out the candle, what do you do? You pucker your lips, you fill your mouth with high pressure air, and you blow. So if you didn't pressurize your mouth, you wouldn't be able to blow the candle, okay? And that's exactly what happens with these propulsion guys. They would like to have the pressure in here very high. So as, German, as, as Herman was working on his project at, at Minnesota, he discovered that there is a way to alleviate this pressure loss 
by making a conical center body, sticking it out of the round pipe, and uh, having this cone develop a what's known as a conical shock wave instead of a normal shock wave. And I won't bother you with the mathematical details, but it turns out the conical shock is a godsend because it allows the pressure inside the combustion chamber to increase. Therefore, the combustion process becomes more efficient, and therefore, this thing becomes a good grad, a good candidate for a engine to power airplanes that fly at supersonic speeds. This conical shock, remember that. Now, some of you may already begin suspecting that this spike here may be somehow related to the spike I showed you a minute ago. And sure enough, in the 1940s and 1950s, uh, supersonic engines for flying objects became very common. Here's a photograph of a Soviet uh, fighter aircraft. You can see the inlet, the air inlet up front. You can see the cone sticking out. Uh, so this was a very hot airplane. Uh, could fly at supersonic speeds very efficiently. And here is our effort. Here is our B-58 uh, Hustler bomber that uh, has four engines. And if you look closely, you will see that the front of each engine has another has a spike coming out. Uh, I had something to do with this design back in the 1950s. And uh, ours, this, uh, this aircraft, the, the Hustler, was uh, our only supersonic bomber back in the 1950s and 1960s. And again, all this thing happened because the efficiency of this engine with spikes up front was very, very high. Um, However, in engineering, we have a rule. If you have a problem and you solve it, the next morning, another problem, <laughs> another problem occurs because of the solution you propose. That's not just confined to engineering. I think a lot of things in life are like that. You have a problem, you solve it, and the next morning you say, oh my God, my solution created this other problem. So. What happened is that after people started building this engine with the spikes up front, they discovered that the uh, the airplane or missile suddenly started shaking a lot. There was a, an instability having to do with the air coming in to pass this spike that was uh, really very bad. Uh, and uh, engineers don't like their structures to vibrate and uh, vibrate a lot because sometimes things break. So somewhere, uh, uh, it 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 uh, it happened that uh, suddenly everybody said, "Oops, this supersonic engine won't work with this thing spike sticking outside in front of it." Uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, articles began appearing in the technical journals, which indicated that this problem was not confined to ramjet engines uh, fitted for airplanes but it was something that happens if you simply if you slim, simply um, uh, a spike sticking out on everything by the way uh, herman had asked me to to photograph this so-called ramjet bus and we did this in a wind tunnel in other words we took a a a a, a, a sample Ramjet, we stuck in the wind tunnel, we blew supersonic flow on this thing, and we took photographs to see if we can detect somehow the reason for this vibration. And what I found, here is, here's the, I don't have the photograph because that was 70 years ago and I, I never managed to get the photograph for my own use. But uh, here is the engine, here is the spike sticking out, uh, what we would have liked to see happen is that there's a shock wave, a conical shock in front of the, of the spike. And uh, but when I photographed this thing, uh, I found out that uh, the shock wave was like this one minute, and the next instant it jumped in front. You see how it jumped in front of the engine here, and then back again, and then back again. 
and then back again. And this back and forth oscillation occurred very, very rapidly. I mean, hundreds of times a second. And that's why we called it the ramjet buzz, because it really provided a very, a very a bad vibration of the whole thing. Uh, incidentally, these photographs were taken in 1944. So we're talking about technology that could uh, have open a uh, shutter openings of about uh, 10 microseconds. In 1944, that was that was really an incredible feat to get a camera with a, that has a fast lens like that. As I said earlier, people started discovering now in 1950s, 1960s. Call from four, zero, six, two, zero. They discovered that uh, if you take a, if you take, look, this is a cylinder and you have a spike sticking out and you stick this in a supersonic flow, some funny thing begin happening. This is what the flow should look like according to the books. It will be a shock wave here and the streamline should move like, whoops, this, like this around. And instead, what people started discovering was that this shock wave would suddenly jump up front and then jump back and then jump back in front. In other words, the flow was unstable. And the design condition, which is this, was not really met if there was certain relations between the spike and the dander. Now, look, I'm asking you to be patient because I'm still leading to the missing missile, okay? So, uh, at that time, I was working with our supersonic wind tunnel at MSU. And I said to myself, well, heck, let me try that. And I had, uh, I had the shop build me a model, actually several models. Here's a cylinder, and here is a cone. And you notice the tip of the cone is rounded. That's the hemisphere on top of the cone. And I, uh, I stuck this in the supersonic flow at Mach number three, and the first thing I knew was, as I was standing next to the wind tunnel and this experiment was running, I could hear this very high pitched whistle. I mean, it was like some policeman was blowing a whistle right next to my ear. What was the reason? The reason was that as the shock wave, as, the, as this model met the flow, the flow changed suddenly from this configuration which was the design condition to this where the shock was expelled forward and then it came back again to this and back again to this and back again to this and i'll show you in a minute that this oscillation occurred over a, a period of only about uh, a few milliseconds it was a very very fast thing in fact the whistle i could hear the whistle because it happened to be within the audible range of my ear uh, like maybe, I don't know, five, ten kilohertz. Uh, I want to brag about this picture, which I don't have anymore. Uh, somewhere this was, this was lost in the shuffle. Uh, there is a technical articles out in the literature where this stuff is shown. But what I want to brag about is the fact that the reason I saw this stuff is because I took hundreds of photographs and after I put those photographs on the table and look at them, I reconstructed this whole story of this being unstable back and forth. Uh, this thing was taken when shutter opening of one microsecond, a photograph taken with a shutter opening of one millionth of a second. Uh, and uh, I'm about as proud of that accomplishment <laughs> as I am about anything else. Because that's... Uh, that's a fast camera, you know. I don't know how many cameras you guys got that you can open the shutter for one microsecond. Anyway, so I confirm that indeed, in our wind tunnel, you can reproduce exactly the kind of stuff that the ramjet buzz was all about. So at this point in time, I began getting my suspicion. And what I did next, I said to myself, okay, uh, 
this is fine. You, you build a whistle. <laughs> That's a lot of science, right? To build a whistle. Something that can really sound the sound. Okay. But exactly what is the actual results of that instability, of that oscillation? In other words, I'm saying, I got to measure something. I got to find out something other than photographs of what's going on. So I had this, the shop build me a, one yet another model, looking like the one I showed you a minute ago, but hit I some pressure sensors. Uh, one on this side, on the what I call the foothill of the mountain here, and another one on the foot of the mountain on the other side. So I can measure pressures on the foothills on the north side of the mountain. At the same time, I'm measuring pressures at the, on the foothills at the south side of the mountain. Uh, these transducers, by the way, they're, they're a tiny. Uh, <laughs> you can have maybe 20 in the palm of your hand, uh, except that they cost thousands of dollars each. Uh, and they had amazing response. They could, they could respond to something like uh, 200 uh, uh, kilohertz. Uh, they were fantastic. I could measure pressure this way. Anyway, so I put this thing in the wind tunnel, and I ran it again at Mach number three. Here is the reference in case some of you are interested. You will want to read the actual article. It's in the Journal of. Uh, spacecraft and rockets back in 1976. Uh, and uh, I want to show you now what I got. I, of course, I got the confirmation of the shock wave moving back and forth along the tip here. But now I have some numbers I can play with. OK, now here is where I need your attention, because this is down getting down to the nitty gritty. Um, this is an oscilloscope trace of the pressure from the upper trench. I call it upper transducer. This pressure is on the foothills on the north side of the mountain. Okay. And you can see what is happening. The pressure is oscillating back and forth like this. Whoops. Forth. And this is the, the other transducer on the south side of the mountain. And you can see that it's oscillating too. Well, there's nothing new about all this stuff. I mean, I heard the whistle. What else do you expect? What I'm learning here is, first of all, that, uh, you know, there's like 400 pounds, excuse me, four pounds per square inch uh, swing between the low pressure and the high pressure. Four pounds per square inch is a lot of pressure. Uh, I'll tell you, what you hear now with your ear for my top, uh, from my mouth coming out to your ear is a tiny, tiny fraction of a PSI. So this guy is a huge, a huge pressure bang. I mean, it's a violent vibration. The other thing to notice is that the peaks occur every about uh, two tenths of a millisecond, which means the frequency is like maybe five to 10 kilohertz. As I said earlier, just enough to be within the audible range of my ear. Okay, so what did I learn out of this? Not a hell of a lot. Uh, I just confirmed what I heard with my own ear. However, and here comes the fun. And here really comes something that bears on the missing missile. Now watch this. If you look carefully at this trace up top, what do you see? And I suddenly saw that and I said, oh my God, what's going on? There is a low peak followed by high peak, a low peak followed by high peak, and so on. And the other transducer on the north side of the mountain had the same situation, high followed by low, high followed by low. And then not only that, when, when the pressure was low on the north side of the mountain, it was high on the south side of the mountain. And immediately I got my really primed. Uh, by the way, here is the oscillation. And all I'm saying is there is a modulation here. The modulation is, of course, half the frequency of the, of the fundamental. So 
I began getting convinced at this point that although the pressure was oscillating like this, the force, you see, when you have a pressure difference, you if automatically you have a force. If the outside wall of your house is at low pressure and inside your house you have high pressure, there's a tendency of your house to explode going outwards, right? I mean, that's basic engineering. That's basic common sense. That's what it is. So I said to myself, hey, what is happening to my little model in the wind tunnel is that its tip is grabbed by somebody and it's pushed on the side many thousands of cycles a second. So what I did, I took an electronic circuit that was measuring not the pressure, but the difference of the pressure between this transducer and this transducer. And that difference is shown on the bottom trace. Now I apologize. This is not very clear, but you can easily see this also has a wave-like structure. So, in other words, the force, the force was oscillating this mountain, pushing it south one instant and then pushing it north the second instant. And I said to myself, ha ha. I said, ha ha. There's something going on. I don't know if you guys ever heard of the wave analyzer. A wave analyzer is a machine that lets you measure vibrations as a matter as a function of frequency. So here is a plot where this is the magnitude of the oscillation, and here is the frequency of the oscillation this way. And the south transducer is here, and the north transducer is here. And what you see is a very high peak at this point frequency this is the fundamental frequency and it's as you see here like maybe six plus kilohertz that's what i heard with my eardrum um and there is a another event happening here which is this one here at half that frequency and that's the modulation this is the low rise high rise low rise high rise oscillation and here down below is the difference so this is these are uh, graphs of pressure this is a graph of force and you see what's happening it's the modulation now that becomes the player here it's that force so what this is telling this graph here is telling me is that the spike in front of my model is pushed to the north side and then to the south side and then to the north side again at the frequency, as you see here, of about three kilohertz. And that was really the decisive factor because at that point, I knew what was going on. I knew what was going on with the missing missile. And uh, if you think about it for a minute, you'll see what I mean. What I'm talking about, a peg, that's pushed this way one instant and is pushed that way the other instant. Back and forth, back and forth, thousands of times per second. Well, what happens? Uh, I'll tell you what happens in my workshop at home. Sometimes I drive a nail into wood and I don't like it. I want to I want to remove the nail. So being a kind of a funny guy. Instead of, instead of using a tool, I grab the nail with my hand and try to shake it loose back and forth, back and forth. And sure enough, after a few tries, the base of the nail gets, the wood gets soft and uh, I can pull this nail out. Either way, what happens when you do this back and forth oscillation is the junction is going to fail on you. This thing is going to break here. It's going to break because of the, and if you do it a few dozen times, that's all you need. But if you do it a few thousand times a second, boom, this guy is going to move. It's going to, it's going to break. And suddenly light came upon my life. And this whole missing missile thing became clear as day. And I'll tell you what happened. The scenario I put together. And I'll show you the scenario of the next slide. 
you're firing this missile and the missile goes into from the atmosphere into space and from space now it starts coming into the atmosphere again and you hit the so-called late entry phase whoops oh my god just a minute I, oh, okay uh, at the same time the missile is descending it is seeing a higher density in the atmosphere and the so-called Reynolds number of flight the rate of number is the product of density, velocity, and the length divided by viscosity. In any way, the, the trigger that tells you what happens with the boundary layer on the hemisphere happens to increase, and suddenly the boundary layer transition point, which makes the boundary layer turbulent, starts creeping upstream from the skirts of the hemisphere to the tip of the hemisphere. This is really what is happening. And as the transition moves forward, the turbulent stresses, heat transfer, friction, etc., begin advancing towards the tip of the hemisphere. In other words, you begin to whittle, you begin to whittle the missile nose tip very fast and making it look like uh, a spike. That stuff is confirmed. I mean, whatever I told you up to this point of the diagram is not imagination. This is hard science. There's no doubt about the fact that the missile and marine number increases the transition, moves forward, that the, the uh, ablation, melting, etc., begins taking place very, very fast, and that the nose tip of the missile changes into a spike. So what's the next step? The moment it becomes a spike, this instability sh shows up and the airflow begins hammering you. It starts vibrating the whole thing. Look, th think of it this way. You're driving to, say, you're driving to, to Butte on I-90, right? And you're doing about 85 miles an hour. And suddenly a gigantic, hand grabs the front bumper of your car and shakes your whole car from right to left from, from up to down. What do you think will happen? <laughs> okay, you'll end up in a ditch. That's what's going to happen. And this is really what happened. To uh, suddenly the periodic force that's now shaking this thing right and left uh, become very, very important, and the pressures, the side forces and the moments, and the pressures begin being astronomical. And there are two possibilities. There are two possibilities. One is the nose tip breaks. Okay, you'll say, well, that's not a big deal. You have a little tiny piece of this thing breaking, so what? Well, if you have supersonic flow and you do not have a perfectly symmetric, geometrically symmetric uh, a missile tip, you're going to suddenly experience very, very strong forces because it's supersonic flows. A little asymmetry will play havoc on you. So the one possibility is that the tip breaks. The other possibility is the tip doesn't break, but as I said a minute ago, somebody is grabbing this muscle and pushing it on the side like, 5,000 times a second, you know, that's, that's big stuff. I mean, that's not funny. Um, and therefore, either way, either by, by asymmetry causing forces or by the, the vehicle itself becoming asymmetric as a whole, that suddenly the vehicle begins tumbling. Now, if you have a missile doing, uh, say, 12,000 feet per second, uh, close to 10,000 miles an hour, uh, and you start tumbling it, uh, you're going to lose it. The thing is going to heat, it's going to start melting, it's going to disintegrate, uh, and it's going to vanish from the radar. And our friend, the missile, destructed itself. 
and vanished from the radar and was never found. And that's basically my story today, guys. Um, to, to thank the uh, honors program for this little show. Ray Myers has been very, very good about helping me. And listen, if you guys have questions about this whole presentation that you think may be awkward to, to ask now or you want more information, um, feel free to email me at home and I'll try to answer your questions. Um, I also want to, sometimes I'm asked from pe by people, what, what, what do I study in order to get into this mode, you know? Uh, what, what was your training in managing to, or attempting at least to interpret this phenomenon of the missing missile? Well, the general training, of course, is aerospace engineering, mechanical engineers do good, uh, physics, mathematics are important, and specifically, uh, aeronautical engineering will help. Uh, the study of fluid mechanics is very, very important. Very important. Whatever you do, uh, that is that this discipline is gonna is gonna come into the picture very soon. Aerodynamics, of course, is uh, a, 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 fa a facet of fluid mechanics. Uh, experimental physics uh, is something that uh, helps a lot. Materials. You'll notice that uh, I have not spoken about the material of the of the nose tip in this case. Actually, what had happened was the the uh, missing missile <laughs> became miss because somebody was trying new material for the nose tip. Um, and that is, in other words, other missiles made it, this one did not. And uh, the idea I think is, the reason I think is because the uh, material used for the nose tip it happened to be unsuitable. It happened to have a low melting point and resistance to friction was not very high, etc. So anyway, okay, I'm ready to answer questions if anybody's got any. Thank you so much. Yes, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, to start off with, Cade was wondering what was done to fix the instability? Uh, the instability was not really fixable. Uh, uh, the, the, the problem, of course, I didn't go into that at all, but the problem was uh, fixed by choosing the geometry of the uh, spike uh, in a way such, in other words, there were only certain regions of spike length that produced the instability. If you shorten the spike or increase the diameter of the, of the sphere, uh, you, you got into uh, places where the instability vanished. And obviously, as you saw from the photographs, people wouldn't have built all those airplanes and things if the instability persisted. So. The, uh, so the short answer to the question is, uh, you solve the problem by arranging the geometry of the engine inlet in a particular way. Great. Kate says thank you. Um, and then next from Nicholas, he says, do you or anyone know if MSU still has a supersonic wind tunnel? I'm part of a club that might be able to make use of it and was not aware that we had one. I can answer that question to the best of my knowledge. We don't have the wind tunnel any longer. Uh, there were, uh, uh, there were, uh, you know, we built a new building. The, the wind tunnel was positioned uh, in a building called uh, Ryan Laboratory. Ryan Laboratory was located where the end of the uh, Roberts, the end of Roberts Hall is on the south end of it. The south end of Roberts Hall was a place where the, the wind tunnel was. And uh, after uh, uh, Ryan Lab was uh, demolished to make room for the new building, we got rid of the tunnel. We got rid of the wind tunnel. 
makes sense. Yes. Um, are there any other questions that anyone has they would like to unmute themselves or ask in the chat before we conclude today? As I said, if anybody wants to email me, I'll be glad to talk to them. Thank you. 